Uh, my name is Madeline Noland. I represent LG Electronics, and I'm also chairing the ATSC 3.0 uh, project, the ATSC T Technology Group 3, um, in charge of all the suite of standards for ATSC 3.0. Um, ATSC 3.0 is a complete system of transport for the over-the-air broadcast world all the way from the bottom of the stack to the top of the stack. It's actually a suite of over 20 standards and several recommended practices and more to come. So this is going to be the whirlwind tour of ATSC 3.0. And my hope is that con content creators, um, folks working on sports, folks working on um, episodic and all the types of content that people love on broadcast television, will get excited about the new tools in the toolbox with ATSC 3.0. Um, I see a lot of unfamiliar faces in the audience, which is great. So um, just a quick question. Um, how many people in the audience consider yourselves to be pretty familiar with ATSC 3.0? That's great. I thought Matthew might raise his hand. <laughs> Good. So um, uh, we will give you guys the overview and perhaps have time for questions afterwards as well. So some of the key enhancements, and some of these things affect the broadcast community, which gives you an understanding of why they want to do this crazy thing in the first place, and some of it may affect um, uh, the businesses around us um, positively as well. So from the broadcaster's point of view, additional capacity. Um, this is a non-backwards compatible system. So if you guys remember the pain of going from analog to digital and the over the air and the converter boxes and all the advertising, here we go again. Um, and so the mandate was, OATSC, if you can't give us 30% better capacity at minimum, don't bother. So we've got the 30% higher capacity just out of the physical layer and then a whole bunch more out of better audio, uh, audio and video codecs. Um, so much more capacity, which allows for more channels and more pixels. Also, better reception. We want to be able to reach indoors. We want to be able to reach mobile devices. Uh, we had some early tests, which are really fantastic. Um, I just came in on the Acela from Boston, and some of the early tests showed the Acela train going at 124 miles per hour with prototype ATSC receivers, taking in a signal off air that was clear and crisp at 124 miles an hour on a train. So yes, it works. Um, better consumer experience. Consumers have a lot more choices these days, everybody says so, and we know it's true, so we need to be able to provide those experiences as well. So talking about interactivity, better accessibility, better quality video and audio, more emergency alerting, and of course new business models to make it uh, the a return on investment worthwhile. Um, advanced advertising um, with the security system, they can do pay-per-view and subscription even over the air. Um, service reporting and data casting are all important. And then also one of the most important things is that this is a hybrid over the air, over the top system, 100% IP based. And so the idea is that a broadcaster could, for example, send main content over the air and interstitials over the top, or they could, for example, send the main audio and video over the air and alternate camera angles and alternate languages over the top all of which can be married in the receiver. So this is a kind of a boring chart. It's really about broadcasters, but I put it up here because it's one of the most important reasons why broadcasters want this. So the little dot there that says A53, that is where we are today. The Shannon limit that you see here shows how many bits can I carry compared to how much robust this, how robust the signal is. In other words, in one end of the chart, I have an extremely robust signal, but not very many bits. And at the other end of the chart, I have a not very robust signal. You might need a big antenna on top of a rooftop, but man, I can get a lot of bits in there. And the Shannon limit shows the theoretical trade-off um, in best case scenario that you can have. So here we are, A53, the operating point of ATSC3 today. The red points, show ATSC 3.0. Broadcasters can operate at any of these points along the Shannon limit, so they can decide, I want to have low capacity but more robust for perhaps my mobile phones or tablets or what have you, or they may choose that I want high capacity, less robust, perhaps for the living room television set, which is very large, you want to have a 4K experience. 
But also broadcasters can walk and chew gum at the same time. They can say, I'm going to operate at this point and this point at the same time. So I'm going to have a mobile service and I'm going to have a fixed service. Or they could say, you know what, I want my video to go high capacity, less robust. I want my audio more robust. So if the signal starts to fade, you can still hear what's going on. For those of us who grew up with analog television, remember that's the way it used to be. Um, so lots and lots of choices. This is one of the reasons why broadcasters want this system. So, but now we get into the other pieces. What is going on with the video? So in this, we have resolutions up to 3840 by 2160, basically uh, 4K. The current system has 1080i and 720p. Um, so this is a major advancement. Um, we also have spatial scalability, so that you can have an enhancement layer of 4K and a base layer of 2K, for example. And with that, you can also use this uh, Shannon limit curve that I was showing you, where the most robust is the HD, HD, and then you can send a less robust enhancement layer um, so that most everybody is going to get your HD picture, and the people with the rooftop antennas can also get the 4K picture. High frame rate, so up to 100, 120. Um, Matthew can tell you how hard we fought to get fractional frame rate out. Uh, could not do it. Uh, <laughs> So fractional frame rate is there, for better or for worse. With any luck, no one will use it, and we'll decrement it one day. But anyway, up to 100, 120 frames per second, including temporal sublayering for the backward compatibility, and a feature called temporal filtering, which helps make sure that the standard frame rate version looks really good, as well as the high frame rate version. High dynamic range. In my personal opinion, one of the most important things in this standard. Um, we have PQ and HLG, and there's a variety of metadata schemes available if you use PQ. And wide color gamut going hand in hand with the high dynamic range. Um, I personally find that uh, content with high dynamic range and wide color gamut will blow your doors off. Um, and I do watch content like that these days, and I really, really like it. So this, to me, is one of the most important pieces of it. Um, yeah, we've got the legacy stuff as well. You can do the SD and the HD, of course, and the older resolutions. Um, but one thing is that if you're not going to use progressive video format, you don't get any of the new bells and whistles. So use progressive formats, or you use legacy formats with SDR and standard frame rates. Two audio systems, uh, Dolby AC4 and MPEG-H audio, um, both uh, perform very well for immersive audio. One of the things that has actually come to the fore in consumer research about these new audio systems is not that you can hang 22 speakers from your ceiling. It's not that you can have the most amazing immersive experience through headphones, which you can. It's that you can turn the dialogue up compared to the background noise. We were really surprised. People love that or at least people who need to turn the dialogue up love that. Um, and these systems can do that. Uh, they can do it in a simple way, kind of similar to the way uh, with a complete mix like we have now. It's not quite as effective. But you can also do it by having the dialogue in a separate channel. So the sound is placed in the best position for the consumer speaker setup. That's also a really important thing. There's metadata in the thing which helps the speaker setup be optimized, which is very good with the SAF, which as we all know is the spousal acceptance factor. No, honey, you may not put speakers in the middle of the coffee table or under everything or, or on my ceiling, yeah. So one of the things that's most important about this audio system is the efficiency, the fact that you can have all these things in separate channels and basically allow them to be mixed and selected at the receiver instead of having to make all those choices at the broadcaster and it's a one-size-fits-all when it hits the person's set-top box or television set. So in this example, we're going to have four complete presentations, which can be in full 5.1 stereo or whatever you want to use, 7.1 plus 4. You have one music and effects channel. You have an English dialogue, a Spanish dialogue, English uh, video descriptive services, and Spanish descriptive services, and some metadata. So when you get to the receiver, the person chooses which of these uh, dialogue tracks they want to have. Music and effects is the same for everybody. So you have these four complete tracks in the same uh, capacity that you have today, basically trying to send one, please, 5.1 set up and maybe a secondary audio channel, which is probably in stereo or mono. So uh, very powerful stuff. A bit about security, which is kind of similar to part of what Brad was talking about. Um, the broadcasters, knowing that they've got an all IP-based system, 
are uh, definitely waking up to security, and there's a lot of benefits to them to security in addition to you know making sure the bad guys don't get in. So uh, we have content encryption, we have the signing of interactive applications and signaling tables, and HTTPS and TLS are required for broadband traffic. We also use WSS for secure WebSocket connections. And like I say, it enables a whole bunch of different things that broadcasters might like, um, in addition to keeping the bad guys at bay. So subscription services are possible. Um, you could potentially be charging a monthly fee for that enhancement layer if you want the, the best of the best. Um, maybe there's going to be a, pr a freemium model where people should register. Still free, but we'd like to know a little bit more about our audience. Um, and a variety of other items that are possible. Um, the signing is also important for signing apps and app signaling. It's important for the receiver because if you send a nefarious app, you can turn a receiver into a brick. And uh, we don't like those telephone calls. And then also sign signaling together with encryption is a very good way of protecting against man in the middle attacks. So kind of in, in summary, uh, excuse me, the interactive content. So this is, this is actually quite interesting. The interactive content describing the conceptual application operating environment. This is one of the most important things. It uses a standard W3C user agent. All your usual stuff, HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. Different from previous television interactive standards in the past, which were very specialized. Um, this is sort of right down the pike. Um, you broadcasters should be able to go down the hall to your digital department, and the digital guys should understand what we're talking about here. Um, seamless, secure delivery in of interactive content. You can send it via broadcast or broadband. Um, there's a separate unique context sort of sandbox for each application. There's WebSocket APIs to manage the receiver features. So if you imagine you come out of the box with an interactive standard which mirrors what the browsers can do, and you want to say, I would like to change the channel on the TV. Well, browsers don't know what that is. So we have TV-specific APIs. Um, for example, you might want to ask the TV, what is the parental rating on this right now? And if the parental rating is set to X or Y, then the application may do some different things. So there's some TV-specific APIs included. Um, and this, as I mentioned, the most important thing is that it's based on standard web technologies. So new business opportunities, flexible physical layer, great improvements in pictures and sound, new interactivity, advanced emergency messaging, more accessibility enhancements, robust signal, higher data capacity, and the list goes on. Um, so you can sort of see why the broadcasters are pretty excited about this. Um, right now, the trials are going on in Phoenix, Dallas, Cleveland, East Lansing, Santa Barbara, Raleigh. Um, I know I'm forgetting some, but the list is growing. Um, and the most recent one to go on air was WKEYT in Santa Barbara. They had a big launch party. It was really fantastic, um, and uh, work continues. So I don't know if I've used up my time, uh, but perhaps I'll check with our moderator. Hi, thanks. It's uh, Lionel from uh, Aldea Solutions. I have a question. How do you see uh, ATSC um, evolving with uh, 5G around the corner? Yeah, excellent question. Um, there's a lot of discussion about ATSC and 5G. And I think that one of the things that comes to mind for me anyways is thinking about a system where there are multiple networks available to deliver data. And ideally, the data sender is going to pick the most efficient, cheapest, most reliable, most secure way to send the data blob that they are trying to send. Um, so for example, it may be that ATSC3 is going to be the best way to get the popular 4K content to jillions of devices all at once. And it may be that 5G is the best way to get certain types of content to people in certain environments. So it's really going to depend on what happens with 5G. If 5G is going to require, for example, a very dense network, which is largely going to be in cities and major corridors, that's going to be one thing. If 5G broadcast really takes off and you can do the high power, high tower, I could see broadcasters starting to get into that business, whether they're carrying a 5G waveform, um, working with 5G carriers or working with uh, customers who want to have dual systems. So for example, let's say that you are a car uh, manufacturer and you think to yourself, I'm going to get a software upgrade to all of my cars or a map download to all of my cars. Big chunk of data going to a lot of devices, more or less at the same time, all the same data. 
So what you may say is, well, I'm going to have an ATSC3 receiver in my car, which is going to be my little ATSC3 hotspot, and it can receive these data blobs. And I might also have a 5G cellular type receiver in my car, which can sometimes get these data blobs and sometimes not, but it's great for the back channel also. And so I can use my ATSC3 hotspot in my car for infotainment and all this stuff. And if I happen to be in the place where ATSC3 is the cheapest and most secure and easiest way to get my data to my car, I could use the ATSC3 connection. In other cases, the 5G connection might be better for other use cases or different areas of the country, things like that. So I think that the way it might evolve, and, and who knows, the next couple of years are going to be uh, uh, quite critical. Um, the way it might evolve is that the two will coexist side by side. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Appreciate it.